Good afternoon. Welcome to Show Tech. Uh, this is a series of films that we do really to explain the very technical side of fashion photography and the filmmaking that we do. So I'm here with Tom, who is Hello. my first assistant. Um, we'll try and run through the story we've just done for British Vogue. Um, it was a couture story. Um, Edward Enifal asked me to do it. And just to take you, give you a little bit of history, um, a, quite a while ago, probably 15 or so years ago at least, I did a story with um, the stylist Simon Foxton, who is a very good friend of Edward's. And um, we did a story, we were using a 10.8 camera, and the lens we had on the 10.8 camera was, well, you, most lenses will stop down, as you know, to sort of f64, um, but this lens stopped down really is an old printing lens. It stopped down to f360. It's an incredible depth of field. Um, so, and as I say, it was an old printing lens. So we put it on the front of the 10 camera, and it meant that you could photograph somebody sitting sort of roughly the crop that we've got on Tom and I at the moment, um, and they would be in focus. And then a landscape, which was perhaps 20 miles behind, would also be in focus. Nothing was pin, pin sharp, but it was all sort of in focus. Nothing was very, uh, very blurry. But it was at a time when there was no Photoshop, there was no way of doing it um, in camera other than using this lens. So we got this lens and we drove around. I wanted to do very um, classic views of the British countryside and putting people in that that perhaps you wouldn't expect to see there, but it was a sort of desire to sort of engage with nature. And we, we started trying to build a tent and to put the person we were photographing inside a tent and then lift the back of the tent up so then you could see the landscape behind them. That wasn't very practical. Um, so then we tried to do it by putting our subject in the back of a, a lorry. So we'd get a big lorry and we'd open up the tailgate and we'd sit our subject on the back of the tailgate, put myself with the camera inside the lorry and then reverse the lorry up to the landscape we wanted to photograph. So that was the incredibly complex way we did it then. And uh, about a year later, um, Photoshop was invented and everybody just thought, oh, they did it on a computer, which, of course, we didn't. So, anyway, long story, still quite a long story. Um, Edward Enifal uh, was very young in those days and was just starting his modelling career and starting getting into fashion. And it was a story that stuck with him. And he came to me uh, earlier this year and said he wanted me to cover the couture which is a very nice thing to cover for a magazine. The couture is incredible for a photographer because it's so, uh, so beautifully made and so rich and embroidered and you know, it has all the sort of finest work um, you know, from the atelier. So it's a, for a photographer, it's very spectacular to photograph. So he, said he wanted me to photograph the couture for British Vogue. He wanted all the models to be of colour um, and he wanted to set them like we did for the story I did with Simon Fox in 15 or so years ago. He wanted them all to be set um, in the English countryside. So it's quite a tricky thing when you're doing a couture shoot, because the first story took me about a month to shoot. But sadly, they don't give you a month anymore to shoot with. So it had to be on in two days. And if you've got a different model for every shot, and you're doing, I don't know, 12 shots, um, then that means 12 models flying in and out. So you have to be reasonably close to London. And we decided actually to photograph in Richmond Park, which is probably the best way to do it because Richmond Park's quite varied and you get great views that sort of stretch across the, the sort of Surrey countryside and then you get the sort of, you know, up, looking up towards London. And so there's, there are sort of lots of different good views within Richmond Park. But we didn't want to use the old 10.8 and the printing uh, lens again, so we used um, a conventional camera. And we stopped down as far as we could stop down, which was to what? Um, well, we stopped down to F16 on this lens um, more because I think the levels of diffraction uh, through sort of digital lenses and into digital sensors is a lot more pronounced than it was when you were shooting on 10.8. And at f16, you've still got a reasonable amount of depth of field. So we photographed the, the model at f16, and that brings the background in. It's not pin sharp, but it's not wildly out of focus. So then after every shot, I'd, I'd do two or three frames of the model, and then refocus on the background and do two or three frames of the, of the background, and then two or three frames of the model again. And that's how I'd work. So there's constant varying the, varying the focus. And then, of course, then now on Photoshop, that we just drop the model into the, you know, and drop the background onto the model so you could just bring the two together. Uh, so that was how it was achieved. But I wanted to have something that looked like... So when, when you apply a painting aesthetic or a painting approach to photography, because, you know, when you paint, you never paint with the depth of field. You don't paint the sort of background of focus. You just paint what you want to see. And so I was trying to apply that to, to the photography. 
Uh, and it gives a, when you look at the pictures in Vogue, it gives them a kind of sereneness to them, a sort of gentle beauty to them. Uh, and that's what I was trying to achieve. Tom, technically, because this is show tech, so we need to talk tech, um, yeah. tell us what cameras we were using. Um, so we were shooting on a Phase 1 XF uh, with an IQ3 100 back, uh, which we sort of came to as a little bit of a compromise, I guess, because we couldn't find exactly what we wanted. We didn't have a lens that could stop down to f360, um, because, as I sort of mentioned a minute ago, most digital lenses start to break up a hell of a lot when you go above sort of f32. Um, so we went and ran loads of tests um, from sort of f2.8 up to about f32 on some different lenses. Um, and really, the image starts to degrade really heavily after f22 and upwards, and yeah, f32, it's it's not very pleasant to look at, is it? No. Um, so we were also looking at some sort of smaller um, sensor cameras, which give us a little bit more depth of field. Um, but we ended up sort of thinking about the whole approach and thinking about how we were going to retouch it afterwards and sort of making an educated decision that um, using the phase one back and the amount of sort of latitude that gives us was probably going to be our best option. So that was sort of how we approached in terms of the lens and the camera. Uh, of course, as I was explaining earlier on, what you've got to try and do is stop the light falling on the model. So you've got to make a, a difference in the light on the model to the background, so the model has to be more in shade. So if you just took a picture of the model, they would be in silhouette and the background would be, be lit. So we had to cast some shade on the model. Um, and as I said before I did that, I put in the model inside a lorry so there was no light falling on them. This time we did, because the, the power flash is so strong, you can actually do that. And I just put a, a kind of... Uh, what was it, a polybod or, or some sort of...? Yeah, we had a sort of few different um, black velvets which we rigged up in different ways depending on the sort of location we were in. So to shade the model from the sunshine or shade them from light, so they're in shadow effectively and in the background it's got the light falling on it. That was the way we, we stopped the daylight falling onto the model, put them in shade and allowed us to sort of do this double focus without too much of a problem. And what else technically from that? We've done the camera, we've done the lens, Lighting, what was our lighting? Yeah, I guess lighting-wise, um, it was quite an interesting shoot, really, because we were in so many sort of varied locations. We were sort of experimenting as we went and trying to sort of work with the landscape rather than going in with one way of how we were going to set it up. Um, so we had, I can't remember exactly how many locations we did over the two days. Uh, but ten? Ten, yeah. Um, so, as Nick said earlier, trying to do five locations in a day is um, incredibly time-consuming in, in sort of many ways. So we would have teams going over to the location following on from us to uh, sort of pre-set up that one. Um, so we'd sort of go round on the recce and try and make an uh, educated guess as to how we would want things to be. Um, so we'd sort of think about where the light was going to fall, where the sun was going to come from, and then we could put in our sort of blackout system in place already to achieve this sort of silhouette that Nick was talking about. And then we had, um, we had some bronze colour twin heads, which we, which we used in a few different ways um, to give us that sort of, you know, really, really powerful burst of light to, um, to match the sunlight uh, that was going on in the background. Um, and so we used that into some photex and some umbrellas and also I think we did a couple direct as well but yeah. didn't um, didn't use that so much. So on the shoot list, you're, you're sort of learning as you go along. You know, when you did the first shot you did a whole bunch of stuff which then half the things you thought were going to work don't work so you abandon it and then you keep on rolling like that. Um, it also happened to be I think the hottest day, <laughs> the two hottest days this year um, which was makes it a little bit more tricky. And we were, you know, we, we set up, one of the other things we did, sort of slightly divorce the model from the background. Um, we set up a sort of steel decking so the model could stand on that so she would be slightly outside of the normal perspectives you get if you just look at somebody standing on the ground. So they could be a bit higher and then with a sort of background behind them. But it was incredibly hot. And as Tom said, what we did, to get those number of shots done in a day, and because it's a location, you're moving the whole team. We had half the team go and set up the next shot, and then we'd do the first shot and then move into that, and that team would go on and set up the third shot. So each time was a sort of, you know, things were being set up for us as we moved from the location. Because otherwise, you, you, I mean, it's, to be honest, you're rushed trying to do six or so shots in a day like that. But um, it was also, as I said, the hottest day this year. 
uh, which did have, it, apart from making everybody slightly more, um, kind of slightly more pressurized than they would have been, it, it also meant that we got a very lovely and quite unexpected shot. There's lots of deer in Richmond Park, and because it was so hot, they were all really, really thirsty. And we were photographing Jordan Dunn just by the side of this really lovely little stream with willow trees and very kind of you know, English 19th century painting kind of look. And of course, the deer are coming across the field. I'm thinking, oh, they'll get, they'll get vaguely in shot. And actually, they didn't. They came all the way down into just into the stream and started drinking from the stream, which is one of the shots you get. You know, you can't really plan to get it. And fil filming in nature, you have to kind of let nature do its thing. You, it, you can't push it or force it. And you just have to sort of, you know, capitalize on whatever, um, whatever things happen. So you have to be reasonably flexible when you're photographing and filming outside. All good? So that, all good. That's our British folk story.